Happy Sunday. If you're new, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve, one of the pastors here. It's our great joy to welcome you here this morning. Uh, if you got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it? Uh, if you don't, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you, right around you somewhere, a black one. Uh, if you don't have one, that's our gift to you. Take it with you, read it till the cover falls off, and then come back and get another one. And you do that for about 50 years till you go see Jesus. There's the goal. All right, that's church in a nutshell right there. Um, now, Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke. If you are uh, new with us, you picked a great Sunday to join us uh, because we are going to step into here a little bit of a mini-series on temptation. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, whether you're a Jesus follower, whether you're religious, spiritual, whether you uh, are atheist, whether you just uh, kind of make it through life on your own, with real no eye toward religious or spiritual things, um, you understand temptation. Amen? No matter who you are, you have felt those times and seasons in life where you have felt temptation. You have a perspective on who you ought to be, and maybe you live by a moral code. Inevitably, life in this world creates opportunities where you come face to face with the reality that there is something that you want that you know you shouldn't want, right? We have all felt that heat, that tension, that difficulty uh, for life in a sinful world. So what we're going to do here today is uh, pause for about three weeks and look at the temptations of Christ. There are three of them. They happen here in Luke chapter 4. We're just going to look at the first one here today. If you have your Luke study guide, anybody still got that? Did you lose it in your trunk? Good job. Six of you still have it. That's great. Uh, let me give thanks really for our, our staff team um, that has worked really hard to put this study guide together. Uh, the work that has gone into that, I pray, has served you well. We made it to the end of the first one. Didn't we do good? Nice. I mean, all right. Now, for you note takers, I'm really going to frustrate you because the last page in the study guide is all three temptations. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. But in three weeks, we'll get a brand new one and we'll get a chance to work through that one together. We pray it's a blessing uh, to you. So hang on tight. Those are getting printed. They'll be here soon. Right, Kenny? Soon? Soon they will be here. I promise. All right, uh, last week in Luke chapter 3, if you've got Luke 4 in front of you there, we looked at two significant realities in the life of Jesus Christ as he gets ready to step into his public ministry. He still has not stepped into it yet. What we saw last week was the validation that Jesus is indeed the Son of God by two distinct objective realities. One is the voice from heaven at his baptism where the voice from heaven and the falling of the Spirit came upon him, and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then we look at a second objective reality that Luke gave to us, which was the genealogy of, of uh, Mary, most likely, that takes us all the way back to Adam. So what you should be thinking as we've closed our uh, study at the end of Luke chapter 3 is you should have Adam on the mind. Because what Jesus is about to do is step into a temptation with the devil. Your Bible begins with the creation of, God, of uh, Adam and Eve and all of creation through God. And then your Bible begins with a tension, a point of conflict where the serpent enters the garden. So if we've proven the fact that Jesus is by divine right the Son of God by being the second person of the Trinity and holy man by being a descendant of Adam, we are waiting to see whether or not this brand new Adam will stand the test. Here's the goal for our time here together. The temptations of Jesus Christ validate who he is. Up to this point, because Luke has given us background information, we've had the word of God, we've had the testimony of others. We've had the, identify, uh, the identification of Jesus both with heaven and with earth. But all of that is the press conference before he steps into the ring. All of that is the conversation about who he is and what he's going to do, and I promise he's going to be bad. And when he steps into the ring, how he's going to act when the bell rings is what we're waiting to see. The identity of Jesus Christ up to this point has been posited, it's been declared, but it hasn't been tested. And what we need to know is for Christians in this day and age, we need to know whether or not Jesus can stand up to the same temptations that you and I face, right? If you've ever thought about it, Adam would be no good as a counselor to you. 
If Adam came into your life right now, he could just talk to you about, I've, I was perfect. I was in a perfect place in a perfect time. Don't you remember what, what it's like to be perfect? No, well, I do. I remember what it's like to be perfect. Now, I didn't do that good, but now everything's broken, and I get that, but man, being perfect was nice. But Jesus enters into the world as we live it. He enters into a world that is beset by sin and brokenness and weakness. And you have to wrestle. You are going to be tempted. You will face seasons, even this week, even this day, where you are going to feel the chafing of your soul and your spirit against life in this sinful world and trying to wrestle through the temptations that you face. And what we need to ask and answer is whether or not Jesus is strong enough to handle those temptations, right? You need to know that. Whether you've thought about that before or not, you need to know that Jesus is strong enough to handle temptations. Hebrews 2 puts it like this, that because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews 4 puts it like this, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So I'm going to give you something, one thing to do at the end of our time here together when we think about how we need to face temptations. But the whole goal over this next three weeks is for us to stand in awe at Jesus Christ going toe-to-toe with the devil and winning. Okay? You with me? Let's pray. Father, for these few minutes as we look into your word, would we gain a greater awe and worship and appreciation for Jesus, our great high priest, who has faced down the devil and all the temptations of hell and has won. So, Father, we pause and give thanks for that reality. Would we see that here in this text here this morning, perhaps in a way that we haven't seen before? For those who come in uh, to this place or are watching online, or wherever they are joining us, Father, for the season of life where there are people in this room, no doubt, who are feeling the pressure and the heat of temptation, who feel the battle on all sides, and who are wondering what you are going to do, whether or not you are strong enough to help them in this season. So, Father, for those who are in that place here this morning, I pray that they would gain great confidence and great joy and great encouragement through looking at Jesus, who is our champion. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, Luke 4. Y'all there? Take a look at Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, pause right there. Uh, We have a moment here as Jesus rises out. The the last uh, action that has happened isn't the genealogy. Luke inserts that in the point that he's trying to make about Jesus and who he is. But the last point of action happens uh, earlier up in chapter 3. If you just look up with me at 321 and 22, that the declaration of heaven, the spirit coming down, resting upon Jesus, the declaration of heaven itself that says, you are my beloved son and you, and you, I am, or with you, I am well pleased. Now the action picks up again here in Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 1, the Holy Spirit is going to be mentioned twice. And Luke is going to tell us two things. One, that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And two, that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit. So let me talk about being full of the Holy Spirit just for a minute. Being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in some times throughout the New Testament has to do with conversion. So when Ananias comes to Saul, who's had the vision of Christ on the road to Damascus, Ananias comes to Saul to lay hands on Saul, who then becomes Paul. And to be uh, what he says in Acts 9, uh, it says this, 917, Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the Spirit being given as a pledge or a down payment as to all of the promises that God will fulfill. But that's not quite how it's used here, is it? That Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit has the affirmation of heaven itself. 
Better being filled with the Holy Spirit, that phrase, better uh, it would be for us to think about how it's used perhaps over in the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, it says this, that do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. For the New Testament believer, being filled with the Spirit is a command. Well, what does that mean for us to be filled with the Spirit? What does it mean for Jesus to be filled with the Spirit? And I think from Ephesians chapter 6, it shows us that we are meant to be ultimately under the control, just like alcohol can control you if you have too much. We are meant to be controlled by the Spirit. So right from the beginning, we've said this last week, that Jesus, as he rises out of the water after being baptized with sinners, he's praying. He's seeking the Father. Number two, as we see here, that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, which means he's under the control and under the direction of how the Holy Spirit is going to lead him, how the Holy Spirit is going to direct him. Jesus shows us what, it li- what it's like to be human. Humans are meant to be in relationship with God through prayer, and we are meant to be under the control of how God leads us through the giving of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, as such, shows us a perfect man's perfect relationship with God. He's totally dependent on the power of the Spirit, totally committed and uh, wholly submitted, submitted to the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now watch where Jesus is. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So as John grew up in the wilderness, Jesus now is led by the Spirit to a place that in the geography of Israel is one of the the most desolate places. I believe it's the book of Mark that says that Jesus was with the wild animals, it says. So Jesus is not around anybody else. Jesus doesn't have the typical amenities of the day. He's driven and led under the leadership of the Holy Spirit to go to a place that is not a comfortable place. He's driven and led by the Spirit out into a place where there is nobody. There is no help whatsoever. Now, just to draw a little bit of a contrast between Jesus' reality and Adam's reality, Adam was in a perfect place. Adam had perfect satisfaction of all of his needs met. Adam had the perfect wife. Adam was an absolute perfect relationship with God. Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, not in a garden. Jesus is driven alone into the wilderness with no other companions whatsoever. Look at verse 2 with me. And for 40 days being tempted by the devil. The being tempted shows us something about these 40 days as Jesus experienced them. If you read this text at kind of just a simple read through, you may miss the reality that the 40 days for Jesus was characterized by temptation. The 40 days was a constant assault and barrage upon his spiritual life by the devil. In fact, the last three temptations that we're going to look at are really going to be the culminating temptation where Jesus is at a point of incredible weakness. And all along the way, you're going to see throughout these temptations the kind of man that Jesus is. 40 is an interesting number. It's 40 years was what the nation of Israel wandered. Elijah got food that made him last 40 days and 40 nights when he faced up against Ahab and Jezebel. The flood came on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So it probably begins to give us a picture of testing that this was a particular season that Jesus was in for a particular reason and in a particular place. But I'd like you just to note this word tempted. The word tempted is is translated depending on the context in one of two different ways. On one hand, it's often translated as tempted. And that bears out in the New Testament. James says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. So that's an interesting verse to think about in the context of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is absolutely pure. 
He doesn't have evil desire. He's God himself, so he's absolute, white, hot, blinding, absolute, holy purity. But we are not, are we? We have temptations and, and desires that James 4 says war against our souls. So when you think about this word tempted, you may think of 1 Corinthians 10 that says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, that's that word used as temptation. We feel temptation. We feel the temptation toward sinful proclivities in our lives of things that we know are wrong, but that somehow because of the warp of our soul, we're still drawn to them. We still love the wrong things and worship the wrong things and are tempted by the wrong things. But the other way this word is used is to test. So that when Jesus in John 6 talks to the disciples about the, the 5,000 people who've gathered around and he tells the disciples, you solve this problem. John tells us that he said this to test them. Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham has to, is called to sacrifice Isaac, Abra Genesis 17 says that the Lord tested Abraham. The Pharisees and the Sadducees come to Jesus and seek to test him. You know a book in your Old Testament where Satan comes to test somebody else? You ever read the book of Job where God says, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's faithful in all things. So if we consider this word from the Satan's vantage point as tempting Jesus, then we could also consider this word from God's side to say the test is about to show us something about who Jesus is. Isn't that what a test does? A test reveals what is on the inside. So here is Jesus for 40 days being tempted by Satan. But let me just talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit that I think is really important for us to acknowledge. Why in the world has the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness? Why in the world has the Holy Spirit led Jesus into a place of scarcity? Why in the world has the Holy Spirit led Jesus to a place where he is all alone? One of the things that I think I've found about my own sanctification life that has been uh, a bigger challenge and maybe a bigger surprise than I ever expected was living out the reality of being led by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever experienced this where you have thought being led by the Spirit means it's going to be green pastures and still waters? But then you realize that as you walk with God over the seasons, you get to some situations that as you walk into them, you recognize I've been walking in obedience and all of a sudden it has gotten hard. Have you ever been there? Where you recognize Obedience has actually led me into more difficult, more painful, more exposing kind of places than I expected. I signed up to be led by the Spirit into peace, prosperity, wealth, significance, victory. Amen? I'd like that path. And rather, being obedient to what I know God has called me to do. Walking in faith with Jesus Christ, step by step, has actually led me into some places where all of a sudden I am in a maelstrom of being faced with temptations and circumstances and things that expose me where I am desperately unable to change my circumstances. You've been there? If you've been there, say amen. Amen. You've been there. So the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus Christ to a place, arguably, of great difficulty. Is leading Jesus Christ into a place of hardship. Now, let me make an observation. Who's in the desert with Jesus? It's not Luke. What human is in the desert with Jesus watching this? And Luke's, It's not like Luke's on a hill going like, look at that. That's amazing. Do you know that? The only way that we have this section in your Bible is that Jesus told somebody. Do you know that? 
that Jesus had a conversation with the people who wrote this down and said, here's what happened when I was out there alone. Which means this piece of text for us is meant to give you information about Jesus that Jesus thinks you ought to have about himself. Right? Jesus is choosing to let you in to what his testing was. You with me so far? Now, look at the remainder of verse 2. Steve, how are you stretching out four verses this much? That's a great question. You don't come to our church very often. <clears throat> look at the remainder of the verse. And he ate nothing during those days. So Adam was in perfect communion with his father. Adam had the perfect wife. Adam was in the perfect place. Adam had all of his needs met. But Jesus is with his heavenly father. Jesus is not in the garden. Jesus is in the wilderness. Jesus does not have all that Adam had. Jesus is in a desert. And Jesus has not been eating. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. If you want, if you take notes, just write down understatement. Right? You ever try to fast for like three hours? <laughs> and you're like, it's 30 minutes until lunch still? So is Jesus at a point of physical strength or physical weakness? Does Jesus have any resources to lean on? You ever notice when temptation shows up at your life, it's always like 2 a.m., when you're sick, someone's got a stomach bug, you haven't eaten all day, the pollen's bad, the money's tight, you're in conflict with your spouse, and at that point, you're expected somehow to be godly. Right? Isn't that the worst? I would rather temptation come when I'm well-rested, when I've had a meal, when the weather's good, the AC is working. <laughs> right? So Jesus is in a point of great difficulty. Jesus is in a point of great physical duress and great physical hardship. Is it any surprise to us that Satan shows up now? It shouldn't be. Because Satan is aiming at you at your weakest. Do you know, do you know why, uh, well, I'll say that in a minute. Look at this encounter. This encounter is two sentences. This is a two-sentence conversation encounter between the maker of heaven and earth and the tempter. There's no straining. There's no difficulty. There's no magic spells. There's no explosions whatsoever, which is, I feel like you could really, I mean, Luke could have done better. He could have made this whole encounter a lot more flashy, but this encounter is simply a conversation. It's simply two people talking. So let's not, just to maybe make a side point, let's not miss the fact that temptations can come in the context of conversation. Right? Remember Peter and Jesus? Peter turns to Jesus, Jesus says, I'm getting ready to go to the cross. Peter says, no, you're not. Lord, this will never happen to you. What's Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You have your, your mind set on the things of man, not the things of God. In one second, a conversation can turn into spiritual warfare. In one second, there can be spiritual temptation put in front of Jesus. In one second. The devil said to him, verse 3, if you are the son of God. Now, in the Greek, that if word isn't really an if word in terms of a question. It's an uh, assumed reality. Uh, anytime you read the scriptures about Jesus' encounter with the demonic, the demonic are never confused as to who Jesus is. Do you know that? They might be surprised that he's there, but they're never confused. They're never surprised. So this temptation right from the beginning has nothing to do with Jesus' uh, self-awareness. 
Jesus has just heard from heaven itself that he is the Father's beloved Son. He is the one on whom the, the pleasures of heaven rests. So this temptation begins not with a question about the identity of Jesus Christ. The devil assumes that. And the devil says, if you are the Son of God. Do you know why temptations are so good? Do you know why temptations are so attractive to your soul? Do you know why temptations work on you? Temptations work on you and temptations work on me because they're specific. That's why they're so good. If you were to sit down and write a list of the top 10 ways to tempt you, how good do you think you would do? Do you think you could do that? Do you think you could create context in which you know, given the right set of circumstances, I will fall? That is a, a great spiritual exercise for you to be aware of how Satan will probably tempt you. And it demonstrates a profound sense of self-awareness if you can write down ways in which you see it's not good for me to be at this time, at this place, with these kind of people doing these kind of things. Amen? Christians, you should know that. So the temptation from the devil to Jesus presumes that he is, in fact, the Son of God, which makes us ask a question. What is the heart of this temptation? Why is it that the chief tempter of all tempters, the one who got perfect Adam and perfect Eve to fall into sin and to doom the human race. What about this temptation is so good? That's your question as you read this. If you are the son of God, here's the temptation. Command this stone to become bread. Now that's an interesting temptation. Satan is asking Jesus to do something that you and those of us in this room cannot do, right? He's asking Jesus to do a miracle. Now, is it sin for Jesus to do miracles? Well, that can't be it, right? He does miracles all throughout his ministry. And since Satan begins with a presumption about the identity of Jesus, it must be that Satan's interpretation of what it means to be the Son of God is different than Jesus' interpretation of what it means to be the Son of God. You with me? So if Satan's temptation is such that if you are, and since you are the Son of God, you should do this thing, then the temptation really has to be an expression of what it means to be the Son of God. You with me so far? This is how good you're going to watch Jesus. Jesus is just going to come out and it's going to be one round. It's going to be awesome. Man, it's going to be so, I can't wait to get there. Satan says, be the son of God like this. Now the question you have is, we've just read the genealogy, is could Adam do this? Could any human ever who's ever been born do this? What do you think? Does Jesus have a trump card as a human, as like a get out of jail free card? Well, I'm hungry. There's no Chick-fil-A around. I guess I'll just... Whip up some rock bread. Is that what it means to be the son of God? Well, it can't, we know, I mean, no, right? That can't be it. Whatever this temptation is, it can't merely be tempting Jesus to use his power. It can't merely be do a magic trick, do a miracle. Now imagine, what is it that Satan is saying with this temptation? And this is why the temptation narratives are so powerful and so important for us, those of us who are human in the room. Okay. Jesus, I know that you've emptied yourself of the divine prerogative. I know you've humbled yourself by taking the form of a man. I know you've come in the flesh as a servant. 
I know you've come down from heaven not to do your will, but the will of him who sent you. But this whole being led by the spirit thing has not worked out for you. In fact, it's led for you, to you into a situation where for the past 40 days, you haven't been eating. For the past 40 days, and I take it, by the leadership of the spirit, Jesus is submitting himself to what God wants him to do in this season. Jesus is submitting himself to a voluntary fast to show us something about who he is. It's a spirit-led, spirit-dependent fast. So here, Satan is saying, God has led you into this wilderness. Your dependence upon the spirit, your submission to God's will has led you to a point of great need. You've submitted to what God has wanted you to do, but he's led you into a 40-day fast. Now, are Jesus' needs legitimate or illegitimate needs? They're legitimate needs, aren't they? That God has led him purposefully and intentionally into a place of legitimate need. Why in the world has God led you into this place where you have needs? Why in the world has God led you to a place where you are hungry? Why in the world has God brought you to this place? Do you think that you can really trust God? Do you think God knows what's best for you? Do you think that God has your provision in mind? He's abandoned you. He's left you here. What you need to do is get out from under submission to the Lord and his will. And you need to fix the problems in your life that God refuses to fix. What I've discovered about the spiritual life is very, very often I take the desires in my life and I baptize them and make them needs. You ever do that? That I take illegitimate desires and I baptize them and make them legitimate needs. And then my relationship with God goes like this. Why in the world aren't you meeting my legitimate need? I mean illegitimate desire. And man, I'm frustrated. And the temptation for Jesus is to just use your power to get out from under submitting and trusting your heavenly father. Don't go through all this dependence. Don't go through all this faith. Don't go through all this resting in the fact that God is a good heavenly father. He knows what's best and he knows how to bring your provision at the right time in the right way. Use your power to fix this. Now verse 4. You with me so far? That's a pretty good temptation, isn't it? You ever feel that? No? That's fine. That's me. One of the things I feel is this. So let's see how Jesus responds to the temptation. Would you agree that the way Jesus responds to the temptation shows us the heart of what is happening in the temptation? Amen? That's what happens. So when Jesus speaks, he doesn't just defeat the temptation. He also tells us what the heart of the temptation is and how we're able to fight this temptation. Are you ever going to be in a spot where you are in need and you're going to be asked because of circumstances, difficulty, hardship, things that you cannot bring to bear or change in your circumstances where you're going to have to rest and rely on God's good, heavenly Father protection of you? Say yes. Yes. Watch this. And Jesus answered him, it is written. <sighs> Man. Now, let's just put to the side the fact that Jesus defeats all three of these temptations with his memorization of the book of Deuteronomy. Which, that's just impressive as it is. So we've, we encounter Jesus in the water, baptized next to sinners, and he rises out of the water. He's doing what other sinners need to do, which is what? He's praying. Number two, Jesus is dependent and reliant upon the Holy Spirit. Are we called to be dependent and reliant upon the Holy Spirit, its leadership, its filling, its power, and its counsel? Yes. Now, Jesus gives us another thing that you have that is a tool in your spiritual arsenal to handle temptation. Prayer. Dependence on the Spirit and the Word of God. 
Now, it's not fair if Jesus just gets to use his authority and his power to create stones into bread. And it's not even fair for Jesus to say to Satan, nuh-uh, be quiet. What Jesus does is show us what it means to enter into battle well. And he does it with the word of God. It is written... You know that when you face temptations, you are not fundamentally in and of yourself sufficient to face those temptations. Do you know that? I'm sorry to tell you that. Maybe nobody's ever told you that. Maybe somebody has told you that you're wise enough, you're strong enough, you're smart enough, you're intuitive enough just to face temptations in your own ability and in your own strength. But at least what Jesus shows us is that even at the end of his physical sustenance, his reliance is upon not grit. His reliance is not upon self-discipline. His reliance is not in any resources outside of himself that just so happen to be in the wilderness. His reliance is upon what God has said. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, why does Jesus quote this? That's our question. Why is this the answer to the temptation that Satan has given us? And to answer that, we have to go back and look at why Jesus quotes this particular portion of the Bible. Now, if you have a cross-reference, you see where it takes you? It should take you all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, specifically one half of one verse in Deuteronomy chapter 8. So what Jesus does for us is take us back to the Old Testament to a small portion of teaching that Moses gives to the second generation Israelites. The second generation Israelites have had all of their parents buried in the desert as they have wandered for 40 years. And for that 40 years, God has provided for them. God says in Deuteronomy 8.5 that their shoes didn't wear out, their feet didn't swell, that nothing happened because God has been sustaining them throughout the course of their wanderings. But here this second generation of people is coming up to do something that they hadn't done before. Their first generation parents got up to the land, had the 12 spies go in, 10 came back with a bad report, 2 came back with a good report. God says, you don't believe me, you don't trust me to go into the promised land, therefore you're going to water for 40 years till you all die and we bring the next generation of people back up to the land. Now this next generation has to get taught. They have to get taught the law of God. And Moses takes a moment in Deuteronomy chapter 8 to teach them a lesson that they need to remember because every generation of every people need to learn this lesson. In fact, every person in this room who is going to face temptation is going to have to learn the lesson that Jesus gives to us right here. So look back with me at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 1. The whole commandment that I command to you today... You shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land the Lord swore to give your fathers. You've got a command. You've got law. You've got the truth of God that's important for your life. In fact, it's it's so important that God's promises now rest on this second generation of people. So that every generation of people has to rest and rely on the truth of God's word, right? Your kids that you're discipling right now are going to have to rest on the truth of God's word. They're going to have to take the faith into the second generation. Just like your parents had to rest and rely on the truth of God's word so that in every generation we have people who are coming face to face with who God is and need to understand who God is and what he says and how his promises guide his provision for his people. But here's what I want you to see in verse 2. These people exist in a continuity of relationship with God. And Moses wants to teach them something. He wants to remind them something about two things, about who they are and about who God is. Would you agree that's pretty essential to life? Knowing who you are and knowing who God is. You have those truths, you're able to walk in wisdom. Look at verse 2. 
And you'll remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Well, what does that mean? What are the ways, Moses, in which God has led us up to this point? We've buried our parents. I know we didn't trust him and believe in him. I know we had difficulties during the 40-year wanderings. But how is it, what is it about God that we need to understand in his leadership of us? The whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years, that he might, what? Humble you. He might humble you. So the, the wandering context, the wilderness wanderings are a particular context created by God to be a teaching environment, to reveal something about you that you wouldn't know without the wilderness environment. Amen? You with me? I'm leading you into a place so that you might discover something about you that you didn't know before. You ever been led into a season in life where all of a sudden your self-assessment uh, started to drop precipitously and you began to be humble and you began to realize, I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything I ought to know. There are circumstances and relationships outside of my sphere of control. And all of a sudden, I begin to recognize that I am not the man or the woman that I thought I was. I have been humbled. And God says, that's how God has led you. Have you ever had the spiritual experience where you feel like you're choking on your own pride? I have. It is no bueno. He's led you that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So Moses, you're telling me that God has orchestrated the wilderness experiences, the times where we have lacked, the times where I have been humbled and exposed and unable to do what I thought I should do, where I don't have the resources spiritually, financially, relationally to make the change that I think I ought to change. And rather than that, I've been exposed as a sinner. I've been exposed as someone who worships the wrong things. I've been exposed as someone who is dependent, not independent. To show you what was in your heart. Don't you hate it when you face temptation and you realize when you get face to face and you look in the mirror that you are not as godly, you are not as sufficient as you thought you were. And Moses says that's how God leads. That's what the wilderness is for. To see whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse 3, and he humbled you. There it is again. And let you hunger. Are there times when God where God will choose to refuse to meet your needs? God allows his people to hunger. One, to teach them about themselves, to teach them that they need support and resources on the outside that they don't have on the inside. And he lets you hunger and he fed you with manna. This is fantastic. Which you did not know. You know what manna means in the Hebrew? It means what is it? They went, there's some stuff out there that we're supposed to eat. What is it? We don't know. What is it? It is what is it. I don't know. What is it? Let's go with that. It's what is it? He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. You're telling me that God did something in a new generation by leading these people into a wilderness situation to expose their pride, to make them humble, to make them profoundly insufficient to what God was calling them to do. And then he chose to feed them in a way that was wholly new than he ever fed their fathers in the past. That he might make you know. What is it that he made them know first? He made them know that they were humble. He made them know what was in their heart. And here's what Jesus quotes. You didn't know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth 
of God. See, the wilderness is not a call to spiritual asceticism, as if Jesus' time in the wilderness was like, I'm going to make it hard for myself down here. You know what I'm going to do? No shoes for me. I'm only wearing sandals. What did John wear? Camel's fur? I'm going to do that too. This is important, guys. You will face a wilderness season, and you will face the temptation to grit your teeth through it. You will face this temptation to think that Jesus and a relationship with God is all about just having less stuff. I'm not going to get that car. I'm going to get the less car. I'm not going to take that job. I'm going to remain at this level. I'm not going to wear shoes. I'm going to wear sandals. I'm not going to wear a belt anymore. I'm getting rid of all belts. You know, I'm going to get rid of deodorant too. People are going to smell my holiness. See, what Moses says is the wilderness is a teaching time. The wilderness is a teaching place. The wilderness is a place where you learn about you some things that you don't want to learn about you and you don't want to confess about you. But at the very same time, the wilderness is a place where you learn something about God that you have never known before. Where God weans you off of yourself. He weans you off of those resources and he brings you into places where you are exposed, where you discover you're not as holy as you thought you were. You don't have it together like you thought you did. And what gets exposed in you is the sin and the pride and the arrogance and the self-sufficiency that don't work in a relationship with God. But at the very same time, God leads you in the wilderness to provide something for you that only he can provide. And this is why this temptation for Jesus is so profound. Because Satan is striking at the heart of the relationship between Jesus and his heavenly father. You can't trust him. And Jesus takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 to show us that for Jesus there's something far more satisfying there's far something far more important there's something that sustains him and it's not bread it's obedience to his heavenly father so while the wilderness for us might take us into places where we are exposed and realize I'm worshiping the wrong things I'm dependent on the wrong things at the very same time it's a testimony of God's fatherly goodness and care to provide our needs and to take care of us when we think he's not It's to bring us into face-to-face communion with God. So for Jesus to stand the test, for Jesus to face this temptation, is for us to see Jesus conquer something that humbles and humiliates all of us in the room. Do you ever question God? Do you ever question his ability to provide? Do you ever question whether or not he's there? Do you ever question that, that he's not going to be faithful, that he's not going to provide, that he's not going to come through? Jesus has felt that temptation too. He's felt that temptation all the way down to the legitimate needs of wanting to put food in his mouth. And he says, even at that point... I won't get out of the temptation. I won't get out of the wilderness. I won't do something that you can't do. And I will take Satan on face to face. And I will be proven faithful as a son of God. See, this is the thing for us. Righteousness often is defined as by keeping a code of ethics on the outside. You don't understand the demands of righteousness. The demands of righteousness have to be internal things. Where at the level of our heart at the level of our obedience, at the level of the motivations and inclinations and desires of our heart, we are totally faithful to walk in trust that God is who he says he is and he will take care of our needs all the way to the end. That's real righteousness. So when you get to the end of temptation and Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but man, the real son of man, the real son of God, the one who stands in our place, the one who faces down the temptations of Satan, says obedience to God, submission to his will, to his time and his plan and his way is my food, is more satisfying to me than turning rocks into bread. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? That the temptation for us so quickly, if you, I mean, if you read Exodus, 
I mean, the people of Israel abandon and critique Moses and God within 90 days. And they do it multiple times after seeing the whole Red Sea miracles. And so do I. But we have someone. Let me just finish with this. A lot of times when you and I face temptation, we get humbled. Amen? We find out that we are not who we thought we were. But God is under no illusion about who you are. Right? God sees you. God knows who you are. He knows the temptations that you face. He knows the, the patterns of sin in your life that where you have failed to be the man or the woman that God wants you to be. He knows all that. And God's not up in heaven sitting there saying, man, if only you would get it together. If only you would be strong enough for this temptation. If only you wouldn't do it again. Remember where Jesus was as we started this story, is that Jesus walks into the water with repentant sinners, confessing that they don't have it all together, confessing that they aren't sufficient on their own. They're not strong enough or wise enough or intuitive enough or savvy enough or spiritually minded enough to be able to be the kind of men and women that they think they should be. And into that water comes someone who loves them. Into that water comes someone who's strong enough to beat the temptation that so easily entangles us. So by the end of this temptation, and here's what kind of the thing I'd like you to meditate on kind of as we close our time. I'd like you to meditate on just throughout these next three weeks something from Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 comes on the heels of Hebrews 11 because I went to seminary and they tell you stuff like that there. And in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 11 is this, this group of people who put their faith in God and sometimes lost their lives. But then Hebrews 12 turns and it says this, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run the endurance, run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know that Christ has beaten your temptations? Do you know that he is strong enough to handle the thing that you are facing right now. Do you know that? That there's no temptation that has seized you but that which is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able. Well, with the temptation, will provide a way of escape so that you may endure it. And the goal to walking through temptation well is not putting your eyes on, on yourself, it's not looking at the circumstances, and not looking at the sin and saying how bad it is. It's looking at someone who's stronger than the sin. It's turning our eyes upon Christ who sat down at the right hand of God the Father and has beaten the temptations that separate us from God. Amen? Father, we need to be reminded of our champion, Jesus Christ. For those in this room, Father, who are facing temptation right now, I pray that even in this moment they would turn and they would look to Christ who is their victory, who is their champion, who is the one who has conquered uh, the temptations that for us so easily trip us up. Would we worship and gain great joy and confidence that Jesus is stronger than the temptations of the devil that we face day by day and sometimes hour by hour? Would our hearts erupt in worship that there is uh, no temptation that he is not uh, strong enough to handle? And Father, would we be the kind of church that brings quickly our temptations uh, into the presence of Christ by which we would gain great sight and great understanding? and that we would walk in victory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.